Hello and welcome. I'm going to do something new today that if, if it goes over well, I'm going to do a lot more of it. I'm going to take, in the past, I have taken large illusions, say the large classifications of illusions, the, the sawing in half illusion or the levitation. And I did histories on those large illusions, those large effects. And I, I covered lots of types of innovations along the way. And I really enjoyed doing those. Today I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to take a very small effect. Uh, many people consider this to be a close-up effect. I can tell you that it plays well in cabaret, because that's, that's my specialty. Uh, by cabaret I mean not full stage, uh, maybe a living room, maybe a little bigger than a living room, uh, not full stage, not close up, you're in that middle territory, that's cabaret, that's what I do. And uh, this is an effect that's been very popular among cabaret performers for centuries. And I'm going to go back and qualify that. It's called the Lippincott Box. And um, it's called the Lippincott Box because it was invented by a person whose last name is Lippincott. Now there's two Lippincotts. And both of them were born after the effect was described in Hoffman's modern magic. So the effect obviously predates the people who allegedly invented it. Now I'm going to get into why it's associated with that person's name and why that person can, is considered to be the inventor even though the effect itself predates. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Basically the effect is an object to an impossible location. Now these right here these two specifically, this one and this one, these are both considered Lippincott boxes. They're considered Lippincott boxes because they're small, they're generally coin size, and typically a Lippincott box is for a coin. And I'm going to get into the presentation in a moment as well. This size, a little bit larger, this is considered a watch box. And it's actually the watch box that was described in Hoffman's Modern Magic. It's a little bit larger and it's designed to take a watch as opposed to a coin or a ring. And then you get a little bit larger and you have a nest of boxes. And the nest of boxes, again, I think is a very effective presentation. Uh, Some magicians might look at these props and say, oh, they look like magic props, I'm not going to use them. Uh, I, I understand that mentality, I really do. When you use a prop that looks like a prop, whether or not it's true, the audience will assume that the prop did the magic and not you. They don't know exactly how it happened, but it had to have something to do with the prop. And this is why the, a, a, an object to an impossible location, one of the most popular versions of that is the bill and lemon. How, how do you gaff a lemon? Well, the fact is you can gaff a lemon, but, but because the lemon is organic, people don't think you can. And so, so that's become a much more popular version of this effect than, than the actual Lippincott box. Object to impossible location. In my opinion, Doc Eason has the best Bill to Lemon available. I believe it's on his Rocky Mountain Magic series. Uh, I think, and I could be mistaken, and if you guys know the answer, please go ahead and chime in in the comments below, but I think that Doc Eason's effect, Doc Eason's variation, it, it, Doc Eason's version is a variation of a Steve Spill uh, creation. So it goes back to that. But if you're looking for the best Bill in Lemon, take a look at Doc Eason's work on the subject. I believe it's the best. I personally, I really like the Lippincott box. I really enjoy it. I, you know, I, I personally, I, I, I mean, look at me, right? The box looks natural in my hand because of the, my personality, because of the type of presentations I do. Uh, it works well for me. I use a lot of, of wooden props. I can bring some out and show you, but uh, I won't do that because these are the ones I'm focused on. But I use a lot of natural wood props in my act. And so this really doesn't stand out all that much. You know, if I, if I were the kind of magician who did nothing but coin slights or card slights, and then I produced this, it might raise some red flags. But because of the fact that I use a lot of wooden materials in my act, uh, it doesn't leap off the page all that much. 
I'll tell you, there's another reason why I enjoy the Lippincott box or a nest of boxes as opposed to a Bill and Lemon. And this is my own personal opinion. Never phase Doc Eason. Never phases Steve Spill. Never phases any of the guys that do Bill and Lemon. They swear by it. And I, and I will say this. The impact on it. I've done the Bill and Lemon. I have performed the effect. And the impact on an audience is stunning. I mean, they just really, it, it's mind-blowing. Here's the problem though, you cut this lemon open and lemon juice gets everywhere. I mean, it's a mess. Now you've got to cut up lemon to deal with. Then you're handing a spectator his or her property back, his or her money back, and it's soaked in lemon juice. That might be okay. I mean, if you're not kind of a neat freak, and I sort of am, uh, that's okay. And, you know, I, the Anderson paper tear, as strong as that is, and it's a wonderful effect, and I've done it many times, as strong as it is, it tends to leave my hands black with ink. So, uh, you know, I tend to like to avoid mess and messy situations, and, and that's another reason why I gravitate to the Lippincott box or to the nest of boxes. Now, Max Maven, who is an historian that I admire, I will buy anything Max Maven will produce. I will watch anything Max Maven does. I admire him. Uh, but he, he did make a stand. He made a comment on the Lippincott box. I'd like to read it for you. He, he said this in Genie Magazine. Jack Lippincott invented an efficient device for vanishing or producing a small object. Today it is best known under its inventor's name, the Lippincott box. But when it was first marketed by Holden's in 1949, the title was Quarter Go. And they called it Quarter Go because they made a quarter disappear and it appeared inside the box. Uh, and I'm going to get into, in, into the specific presentation in a few minutes. <clears throat> but that's what Max Maven said. Now there are two Lippincotts. One Jack Lippincott or John, and the other Malcolm Lippincott. I'd like to give you some background on both of these guys because they're both associated with the box. You see how, how mysterious this history can get. All right, Jack, otherwise known as John. John Jack Wright Lippincott was born October 14th, 1909 in St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. He died October 15th, 1994 at the age of 85. Jack Lippincott was an amateur magician and the professor of psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. He was a longtime member of the IBM and served as president of the St. Louis Ring in 1946 and was a large part was a large part of the 18th annual IBM convention in St. Louis that year. Jack wrote various articles for the Linking Ring and it is this gentleman, Jack Lippincott, who is most commonly associated with the Lippincott box. And once again, the smaller version is the Lippincott box. This is a watch box. This is a nest of boxes. Get into that. Now, now Malcolm Lippincott was born December 5th, 1895. Henrietta, Texas. Don't have a, uh, don't have a date when he crossed over. But he was born in 1895. It's important because this book was published long before 1895. Mal Lippincott was a vaudeville magician who started performing professionally in 1915. He started as a sideshow magician for a circus. Later in 1916, he had a fling with the movies playing lead parts in slapstick comedies and sometimes lead parts in dramatic films. During World War I, Lippincott, Mal Lippincott, served as a sergeant, and near the end of hostilities, he was transferred into the Army Entertainment Circuit and began touring with his own act in 1919. In 1922, he added mind reading to his act with his assistant wife, Maxine. Lippincott mainly did private society shows from 1923 until the Great Depression years of the 1930s, when he then started to play mainly schools, theaters, and fairs. He was an early member of the IBM with an IBM number of 855. And now, it, it, it is either... Now, this is sometimes... Mal is associated with the invention of this device, sometimes Jack. I, I bring that to you because this is the way magic history is. 
Who invented it? Who did it? Who did it first? Who should I credit? Sometimes that can get pretty murky. And with the lip and cup box, it is murky. I mean, how many guys would you guess had the last name of Lippincott who were magic inventors and magic performers. Well, there's at least two, and they're both associated with this prop. In the 1940s, the Lippincott box was marketed by Max Holden uh, as quarter go. It was marketed also by Harold Martin of Martin's Magic. Uh, Lippincott's quarter go was reviewed by Don Allen in Genie, 1958, the December issue. Here's what Don Allen had to say. This is an old favorite of mine and is an excellent pocket trick. A marked quarter is placed under a handkerchief and given to a spectator to hold. A beautiful wooden box, padlocked. And I, don't have the, I don't have the padlock on it because I wanted to show you the inside, but obviously it has a padlock, a latchet here, so you have a padlock on it. Uh, a beautiful wooden padlocked chest is placed under another spectator's palm and an unprepared glass or tumbler is placed on top of the chest. Now here's the presentation folks, I love this. The handkerchief which holds the coin is held over the mouth of the glass. A spectator drops the coin into the glass. It is heard to clink. The handkerchief is whisked away the glass is empty, the chest is unlocked, and inside is their marked coin, and it is indeed their original coin. That is the presentation that, that I have for many, many years associated with the Lippincott box, and I think it's a brilliant routine. Obviously, Don Allen, who if you know who Don Allen is, he, he really was a definitive performer of his time. He thought this was a great effect as well. A Martin's Magic Shop ad in Genie indicates that the routine was by Mal Lippincott. See, so some people credit Jack, some people credit Mal. So I don't know, uh, but I'm going to get into the real history of the thing in a second. Now, Hoffman's Modern Magic was written in 1876. 1876. Right, at least, at least 20 years before the birth of Mal Lippincott. So, and, and, and here it is on page, now this is my version, this is Dover, Dover version, but page 219, it's getting into effects with apparatus, and the watch box is described, and not only is the watch box described, but the watch box is fully illustrated in its operation as well. Now this is the watch box right here. As you can see, the watch box is quite a bit larger than the Lippincott box. I think what happened here was Jack or Mal, one or the other, decided to make a smaller version of the watch box. And, and specifically for the vanish of a coin or a ring. And when they did that, they decided to market their own version of it and call it their own. This happens a lot in magic. You see uh, Horace Golden in, in, the, in the history of the sawing illusion, uh, obtaining a patent on the illusion and then suing anybody else who's trying to do it, including the guy who originally invented it, P.T. Selbit. So uh, now, now, as far as I know, neither one of the Lippincotts ever sued for proprietary rights. The, the, the effect just got associated with their name. But my point is, the basic mechanism for the effect... Now, Modern Magic was written in 1876, but it compiled, it compiled magic and illusions from much, much earlier than 1876. So this box, the watch box, might have been around for 50, 60, 70 years prior to its publication in Hoffman's Modern Magic. It goes back to the old saying, folks, if, if you want new magic, read old books. Right? I mean, the stuff, by the way, uh, the rattle box is fully described in here. A number of the effects that, uh, that are in Tarbell is described in here. So, uh, Hoffman's Modern Magic, 1876, still a good investment, folks. Really is. Uh, the point is that the, that the box, the particular mechanism associated with this box that, that makes it work, has been around for many, many years. It, it, it was not clearly invented by either Mao or 
by Jack. It's been around much longer. Uh, but it, it's possible that one of the two gentlemen came up with the routine that I just described, that Don Allen just described. Now, here's the thing, too. Here it is. Uh, this is Tarbell, Volume 1. The first full effect that's described. Now, this is Lesson 4. Uh, he goes into some history. He does the history of magic. He does sleight of hands with coins. And then he gets into Coin Tricks, Lesson 4. It's called the Dissolving Coin. And it's the exact effect described by Don Allen. Right here, Tarbell, Lesson 4, Trick Number 1. Now, I use... I use this coin. You probably can't see this on camera. Uh, this, this is a brass coin with an image of Houdini on it. And in fact, it gives Houdini's date of birth, date of death. It's a commemorative Houdini coin. It's a very nice coin. I like to use the Houdini coin when I do it because this reminds me so much of a sub-trunk, right? Or, or a trunk that Houdini might be locked in. The fact that it's padlocked uh, looks a lot, I mean, this one looks even more so. So you take this coin, you put it under a handkerchief, you give it to a spectator to hold. This resembles a water torture cell, right? And it goes on top of the box. The coin is dropped into the water torture cell or the, or the shot glass. The handkerchief's whisked away, just like when he did the water torture cell. He's not there, he's gone. Open this up and he's inside. I think it's pretty killer. Now you might say, well, you know, it's not their coin. You can take a, a what I like to do is painter's tape or masking tape or something like that or one of those, those little circle pieces are kind of sticky. But you take a piece of that tape, they can initial it so they know it's the same coin. I think it's, it's a pretty decent effect. And again, that's not my invention, folks. I, I didn't come up with I don't know who the inventor of that was. Who, who said, hey, I'm going to do the Lippincott box routine, but I'm going to use a Houdini coin. It wasn't me. It might have been Dan Harlan. It might have been Dan Harlan uh, in, in, his, uh, in his Tarbell series. Uh, but it, it certainly wasn't me. <clears throat> not my idea. I just like the idea, and I do it. So... Folks, that is my two cents on the Lippincott box. Once again, this one, slightly larger, works by the same mechanism. It's a nest of boxes. Uh, obviously, the first one is padlocked. The inside one isn't. They don't have enough room for that. This is a watch box. And these two are Lippincott boxes. Fantastic effect. I enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe. And please comment down below. Hey, this is the first time I have done a small effect. Up until now, I've done this, the sawing illusion. I've done the levitation illusion. First time I've done a small effect. If you like what you see here and you'd like to see more small effects analyzed from their point of origin onto the present moment, let me know. Comment down below. I'd like to do more of these. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.